So getting older has uh, some downsides, but we're going to talk about some of the upsides of, of getting older as well. And uh, let's take this passage of Scripture and read it together out of Psalms chapter 71, beginning at verse 14. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all the day. For I do not know their limits. I will go in strength of the Lord. I will make mention of your righteousness and yours only. O oh God, you have taught me from my youth. And, this, uh, and to this day, I declare your wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, asking that you would open our, our understanding, that you would help us to hear from the Holy Spirit today what you're saying. I'm, all, I'm reminded, Lord, that these gatherings, when we come together like this, there's so much more going on than uh, just what we see with our eyes. But the Holy Spirit is interacting with us through the service, through worship songs, through uh, the ministry of the word. We want to be sensitive to what you're saying to us. Open our ears, hear from you, and let our lives be transformed and changed in your presence in this encounter today. And we thank you for that, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. They say that getting old is not for sissies, and I can tell you it's, it's not. Uh, but there are some very wonderful things about getting older that I'm starting to experience, started even before uh, turning 60, and that is that people tend to be a lot more forgiving and they, they, you know, of your mistakes and accidents and, and things like that when you're older. You know, they look up, find out you're, oh, he's just old, you know. And uh, so I, 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 I was at the grocery store not too terribly long ago and I was having a terrible time, you know, trying to get the cart disengaged and and this uh, young lady comes over, oh, oh sir, just kind of let me help you with that, you know. And, but yeah, I'm going to let you help me with that. And uh, so, you know, a couple of clicks and boom, we're uh, on the way, you know, and it was, it was great. Uh, there are also senior discounts, right, for us as we get older. And so I can get the same breakfast you get and, get, and save a little bit, right, $1.50, two, two bucks, whatever. And uh, so you get the Denny's discounts, you get them at movie theaters, you get them at restaurants. Uh, ages kind of move around, but I've kind of hit the mark now. I'm, I'm there for all of them. So I'm looking forward to taking advantage of more of those senior discounts. Uh, material possessions, though. Material possessions you hold to a lot more loosely. I've watched my kids, and they've got their eyes on certain things, you know which is a little disconcerting, you know, <laughs> as they're milling through the house and now observing, yeah, well, my dad may not be here a whole lot longer, and I really like that. Um, and uh, yet, I'm finding that I don't really care. You know, I'm kind of enjoying the whole deal because, you know, what I used to say, don't touch, don't handle, don't breathe on, don't think about, you know, is now like uh, the grandkids can have it. You know, here, play with it, you know. Uh, it's you just hold things a lot more loosely and that's the fun part of, of getting older you just aren't holding on to things so tightly and so concerned about the things that you have and possessions that you have uh, you get better birthday gifts when you get older from your kids and Christmas gifts and stuff like that because they're older and they can afford to buy them so it's really great you have that to look forward to as you get older you know uh, no more of these hand-painted little things to hang up on your, you know, refrigerator and stuff like that. You get real stuff, you know. Uh, not long ago, you know, my kids all went in together and, and bought me a Traeger grill. Now, that would have never happened, you know, when they were five, six, seven years old. But, man, this is great. You know, they're adults and they have money, and that's really nice. That's cool. I found that you also, you live wiser and you make better decisions um, you know, and, and you advise better as you get older because you've experienced a lot of things. And, and so, you know, not having to second guess as much as you did and, and, you know, living a lot wiser, it makes it a little easier on you. And a lot of times you're making decisions way up in front, you know, 
uh, because you have had the experience and you've kind of been down that pathway. So that's a fun part of getting older, too. Uh, you are less focused on people and uh, people pleasing, I'm sorry, and more focused and committed on, on res getting the respect of people around you. So you're less focused as you get older on people pleasing and trying to make everybody happy, but really more uh, focused on you want to in engender the respect of those around you. You want to live in a way that people will respect you and, and, and uh, respect what you have been called to and what you're doing. So a lot of great things about getting older that for those of you who aren't there yet uh, have to look forward to. But I want to talk to you this morning about these, this passage of Scripture and what I think is crucial for us to understand because we are all aging and some of you are still very, very young, but every year we're adding another birthday. And I think it's important for us to understand how to get older for the glory of God. What does it mean to get older for the glory of God? And what it means is you get older uh, for the glory of God in a way that glorifies God and that makes God glorious in the eyes of others. And I think every year that that needs to be something we aspire to do. That in this next birthday, this next year, I am going to declare the goodness, the graciousness, the glory of God and show him to the generations behind me. It means living and dying in a way that shows God to be all satisfying treasure that he truly is. And it really does then conflict, I think, with a worldview of what it looks like to get older and retire and have the life that the world has, has a picture that we should have in retirement. And when we are living to the glory of God, it really takes on a different kind of dimension, a different kind of, of uh, look for us when we think about retirement. As strange as it may seem, you know, Michelle and I have had conversations about retirement that, uh, that are different. In, and uh, some people look at us strangely thinking, you know, if you exit ministry, you exit your job, you know, why don't you guys just travel the world? Why don't you find a place, you know, near a beach somewhere, you know, where you can drive down and, and hang out and, uh, you know, just enjoy whatever the twilight season is for your life. But, <laughs> amen. Uh, but our looking at retirement down the line for us, we, we have had some strange conversations. Wouldn't it be great to go around to, uh, you know, different churches across the nation and spend like a season there? You know, we get a trailer, spend a season there, and we would offer to help them with their children's program. You don't have children's teachers, Sunday school teachers. Uh, you're short on ushers and greeters. You know, we're, we're just going to hang out for three months or six months. We're at the trailer park down here. We're going to pay tithe. This is going to be our home church, and we want to help you. We want to serve you. We want to serve your people. We want to lift up the arms of pastors and encourage them. That sounds really strange, doesn't it, to people in the world who think about retirement in a completely different way. But what we want to do with all of our life and what we've committed to doing is glorify God and to show him to be the treasure that he truly is. And so we want to, to reveal uh, for our whole life the greatness of God and what he has accomplished in our lives. And so the world's view of what it may look like to retire is different, I think, for us who love God and care about him because this life isn't all there is, and we're looking forward to a, an eternity. I've had a, a reoccurring dream a couple of times, and the Bible says old men dream dreams. And uh, it's, it's been this, this fabulous place, you know? And uh, the only thing I could connect it to, it, there, there are elements of the world, but it's, it's so different that I, I, I would relate it to heaven. And uh, we love the water. Michelle and I love the water. And, and the water has been, uh, you know, in, in these dreams, uh, you know, just a big part of it. Land and water, it's beautiful, but the water is different. And, uh, you know, you breathe in it and you breathe out of it. And uh, it's just fabulous. No pollution and just, just grand. And uh, it makes me think that God's got a retirement plan for me. If I will just finish the work here and do what he's called me to do that I can't even imagine or get my mind around. 
And so those, those kinds of things and God's word are so comforting to me about where I am going and where I'm going to spend uh, eternity. I want to do what he's called me to do here. In John chapter 21, verse 19, Jesus told Peter by what kind of death he was to glorify God. There's a different, there are different ways of dying and there are different ways of living just before we die. But for Christians, the final living and dying are supposed to make God glorious. All of them are supposed to show Christ, not this world, but we're supposed to reveal Christ to our world and show his, that he is the supreme treasure. So how are we to live for God and how are we to die for God? And I think this passage does a great job of kind of breaking it down for us in terms of how we live for God and then in the conclusion about how we're going to die for him. We open with the the opening segment there that says, I hope continually. I will hope continually. That word for hope in the Greek is the same word in the Hebrew Old Testament, yahal. And they have the same exact meaning. Different words, same exact meaning. And uh, in the Old Testament, you might uh, remember finding this word yahal in uh, Job chapter 13, verse 15, where Job says, talking about, uh, talking to his friends there about all the afflictions and things that have happened to him on on this earth and the suffering that he's going through. And he sums it all up with this terrific faith-filled statement when he says about God, though he slay me, yet will I trust, yahal, put my hope, trust in him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. The kind of hope that is being spoken of here is not wishful thinking or choosing to live optimistically. It's, It's a hope that's recorded for us of a sure foundation that we can build our life upon, a kind of foundation through which we can make daily decisions, anchor ourselves, and live comfortably. We can build our entire life around this hope. It's not like Vegas going to the the gambling table and rolling the dice and saying, boy, I sure hope it lands on sevens, or or spinning the wheel and thinking, boy, I hope that I hit the jackpot. That's not the kind of hope at all. It is a sure, certain, anchorable foundation in Christ Jesus that's being talked about right here. The second uh, phrase I'd call your attention to there is he says, and I will praise you yet more and more. What I've found in my life uh, to this point and expect it to change it's a certainty and a surety of, of living and that is that gratitude is a value and and uh, it is it is uh, as a value it, it's it's a key for us to happiness and and to kindness when those people who live a, a life of gratitude who are grateful and are living that way every day those are the people who are the happiest and they are the people who are the kindest They really do have an appreciation for every breath, for every moment that's going on. And I think that it's impossible to really have that kind of gratitude functioning in our lives without having been anchored to the true hope. When we're really anchored to the true hope, we're holding loosely to the possessions that we, we have in our lives. We are grateful for everything that's happening. I had the opportunity to spend with family over this, uh, this birthday celebration and just watching the kids and the grandkids and hanging out with them. Man, I never thought one day that that would be the, the greatest thing about life. That would be so much fun to just sit with my grandkids, you know, while their parents go off and and enjoy going down a, a uh, slide into the water, you know, at the water park or, or uh, whatever. But what a joy it was. I mean, Michelle and I were just having a blast with these kids and, and uh, sharing moments with them and learning to be so grateful for everything that God has given to us and what a blessing it is. And the more that we focus on, on uh, gratitude, the more grateful that we are, the more thankful that we are. It's just kind of a, 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 a cycle that just keeps going. The more grateful you are, the more grateful you become, the happier you are, uh, the kinder that you are. 
praise and worship are kind of a, a natural outflow of a grateful heart. It says in Psalms 103, verses 1 through 5, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and, and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He said, he goes on to say in this passage that we've read a moment ago, my mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all day, for I do not know their limits. My righteousness, or I'm sorry, let me read it again for you. My mouth shall tell you, tell of your righteousness and your salvation all the day, for I do not know their limits. You know, it was a, it was a natural part of my upbringing, um, my dad would suddenly and without warning just start praising God and thanking him for his goodness and his righteousness. Hey, we, we could be driving down the road and uh, I'm in the back seat, you know, playing a game to occupy time or doing something. And uh, all of a sudden you hear my dad and it wasn't loud, boisterous. It was just a natural part, just like he was breathing and talking. Just want to thank you, Lord. Just want to thank you, God, for all the goodness. Want to thank you for my family. God, I just am so grateful for I, your righteousness, your salvation, all the things that you've been doing in our lives. And as I grew older and, and, and began, my relationship with God began to, to grow, I, I came to understand that that is a natural part of being a born-again Christian. It just kind of flows out of you that, that just as the, the psalmist was saying here, my mouth shall tell of your righteousness. I'm going to declare it. I can't keep it shut. The goodness of God is spilling forth out of me based on what is happening in my life. And as I developed this, this ongoing and growing relationship with the Lord, I came to found, find that that same kind of thing that was happening in my dad's life was also happening in me. I was beginning to spill out and talk about the righteousness and the goodness of God. Spurgeon says, God kisses away the fear of aging with his promises. Philippians chapter 1 and 6 is one of those promises. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I was six years old when I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, and there has never been anything enticing that the world has had to offer that has, has even come into the same room of looking attractive or enticing to me to draw me away. At the age of six, I surrendered and gave up all of my bad habits. <laughs> and I gave up everything, and I made, I made a full commitment to Jesus Christ. At the age of seven, uh, my parents were holding a revival in Corpus Christi, and uh, many people had come to know Christ there, and they asked me at that point if I really understood what it meant to be saved, and I did. I was, I was completely committed in my relationship to Jesus Christ. If I wanted to be baptized at the end of that revival, we went down to, to Corpus Christi, to a river there, and I was baptized. Corpus Christi means the body of Christ. I was baptized into the body of Christ. <laughs> There are memorable things for me there. You know, we were in a Pentecostal church, so uh, one of the ladies that got baptized who had lived her whole life in sin, and she was uh, probably near where I'm at in terms of age right now, and she came up out of that water so excited, and I thought she walked on the water all the way back to the, to the shore. She was praising God and shouting, and her hands were up, and tears were rolling down her face. And it was very memorable to me. I've had many, many memorable experiences with God that have come through his church, and his church family and relationships with God. I put my trust in him. And I've never had good cause or reason to turn away from that. My question for you this morning is where are you in your relationship with God? Where are you in terms of your committed relationship with God? More of his promises in scripture, as Spurgeon was talking about, kissing away the fear of old age 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, He will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you are called into fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jude uh, chapter 1, verse 24, He is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of the glory uh, and the great joy. Romans chapter 8, verse 30, Those whom He predestined, He also called, and those whom He called, He has justified, and those who He has justified, He is also glorified. God doesn't lose any along the way. We can get lost, but he doesn't lose any. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what's happening in your life. And he he can sustain you through every moment, every trial, every difficulty. What a season we're going through in 2020. But God is big enough. And he can handle it. And he can take us through each one of these. And, and we're reminded in Romans 8, 31, another one of the great promises of God, of God is for us. No one can be against us. Yeah. Yeah. If we're going to make God look glorious, and that's what we're aging about, is to demonstrate and show the glory of God. If we're going to make God glorious in these last years of our lives, we must be satisfied in Him. He must be our treasure Our decision-making must be built around that. I've said this many times for for parents. Uh, We we raised our children to build their calendar around God's house, His church, and the gathering of His people, to worship God and to put Him first. So there are many things throughout the years that were um, enticing to our kids to be a part of, but they, they... did not want to do those things that conflicted with opportunities to come together with God's people and to serve. And even as they got older and took jobs and we wanted all of them to work and learn the value of working, that we had them have conversations with their employers to that they might understand there's a window of time on Sunday that is not available to you. There's a window of time that we're going to be gathered together to worship God and you have the rest of that calendar but this you cannot have. And there were times that uh, employers tried to, you know, violate that, and uh, our kids would uh, have conversations with them, and because our kids were good workers, and they valued them as an employee, they made the adjustment, right? Because our values were to be together with God's people in God's house. That He is a treasure, and we value Him, And it isn't something we just go to as an event, but we come here to be changed and transformed for His glory. The life that we live now must flow from an all-satisfying love and relationship with Jesus Christ that the whole world can see. But living that way is sometimes contrary to an unregenerated human heart that stands uh, out for something, you know, Uh, else than the beauty of Christ and those kinds of things. And so when people see us living for the glory of God year by year and putting our values uh, of Him first and in first place, it stands out as as different and remarkable, and they're interested in how it happens. Now, I, I was among the baby boomer generation. We've got different generations in the building and different generations that are listening online, but I was a part of the baby boomers. 78 million boomers, uh, ages 43 to 61, over 10,000 turn 60 every day. I'm in good company. <laughs> and if you read the research, we were a very self-centered generation. I'll read a few of the things that they have researched about my generation. Our likes, we like working from home, anti-aging supplements, climate control. Dislikes, wrinkles, millennial sleeping habits, social security, and insecurity. Hobbies, low-impact sports, uber-parenting, 
whining and dining. Hangouts, farmers markets, tailgate parties. But in resources, we represent 2.1 trillion of the resources for America economy. And my prayer for my generation and for all the generations is what the psalmist wrote here. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. That God would give us all the opportunity to declare his glory to everyone, even as we age all the more that they would see the goodness of God Amen. and have a, have a desire and a passion to live for him, to love him, to serve him with all of their heart, all of their mind, and all of their strength. And that's my prayer for you this morning. That God is going to help you to live for his glory year by year. If you need to reevaluate what your retirement plans look like based on treasuring and valuing Jesus, this is a good time to do that. To sit down as a husband and wife and say, what do we really want our legacy to be? Because what are we going to leave behind? You know, and I, and I really do. It's a joy for us to, uh, you know, and a blessing and very humbling to see that our kids love God and and want to serve him, and that's really our legacy. It really is, and is passing on, uh, hopefully, to our grandchildren as well. We were in a worship service not too long ago, and I saw, <laughs> I saw Allison raising her hand up and worshiping the Lord. And uh, uh, Eleanor was just what I was laughing about. Eleanor over here was just trying to help me preach. She was adding some things, some important value stuff that you needed to hear. It's uh, it's so great to see that being passed on. But it happens not by accident. It, is, it happens as a result of us being intentional in the way we live our lives. They're not only watching you know, how we're living right now, but how we are retiring and how we will eventually die. And to the glory of God, we have this opportunity. And people before Michelle and I did it for us, modeled you know, how to age with dignity and how to love God and put him first. And that set us up for success. You know, we saw them uh, glorify God and praise him. I'll tell you, I loved her mom like my mom. And uh, both of them played keyboards. And, and we would gather around together and sing God's songs in worship services. We would sing and the whole congregation would sing uh, with us. And those are treasured, treasured memories. But they, they helped me to remember how to age you know, to glorify God. And what a treasure he is. What a blessing he is. Many of our vacations were spent going to conferences and, and revivals and places to worship God. People might think, what a waste of time. You know, why don't you just go to the beach? Now, we did some of those things too. You know, we're not uh, that holy, right? Um, we, we've had fun and we've enjoyed life. We just got back from spending a few days at the Great Wolf Lodge with our family, gathered together and, and celebrating. But many times, you know, our kids have wanted to, we have wanted to be where people of God have gathered and to worship him. I grew up, my mom and dad were pastors and they took us on vacation to general council. And of course, wherever that was happening, you know, across the nation, sometimes, you know, in Florida, sometimes in California. And, and we would get a few days here and there to go do something else. But it was all really built around worship services, loving God. Uh, being together with God's family. And those are treasured, treasured memories for me. I wouldn't trade them. I really wouldn't. For another day at Disneyland, I mean, it was just a great, great time. Going to camp. You know, I, I can remember when I was younger and uh, I was in my late teens, you know, 18, 19, I was old enough to be a, a, a sponsor at camp. And so I would take time off work, take my vacation time. I only had two weeks vacation, take a week vacation to go with a bunch of kids to camp, you know, to, to church camp, you know, because I was taught how valuable that is and how precious that is. And I love those moments. 
praying with kids around the altar who made commitments to Jesus Christ, surrendered their lives wholly to God and, and answered a calling upon their life. I would never trade it. Now that I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation and your power to everyone who is to come. Let that be our prayer, our desire, that we would commit to that. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. This is a place for us to make a commitment to Jesus Christ to live to the end strongly. That we might declare along with the Apostle Paul, I've fought a good fight, I've finished the course. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. But not to me only, but to all who love his appearing. Paul is saying, you know, all, all of us, all of us have a treasured eternity. But let's, in this life, reveal the treasure of eternity to all mankind around us and show them the greatness of God. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, asking, Lord, that you would help us to order our lives in a way that is glorifying to you that we would demonstrate to the, our generation and, and the generations coming the goodness and the greatness of God, of making you the Lord and the leader of our lives, the priority of that in our life revealed to others around us, that they might ask questions about you, that they might be inspired to make a commitment to you, that through our example, they will see a better way to raise their children, a better way to love each other as a, as a couple, a better way, Lord, uh, to, to spend a, a weekends, a better way to spend their Sundays in particular, in your house, in your presence, around your table. You love us so much, God. And I'm asking that, Lord, you would not fail in any way to reveal yourself through us, that you would help us to unite with you, that you might overcome a selfish nature in any of us that at one time or another might seek our own good and not the good of others around us. That you would convict us by the power of your Holy Spirit and then through your empowering of the Holy Spirit, you would empower us to live a life above what we can do on our own, to demonstrate what a treasure you are and how valued you are. We come to you asking that, Lord, in Jesus' name.